Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello to people joining us from all over the country for our webinar for International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Um, my name is Jo Foster. I am lucky enough to be the director of IRIS, and I'm joined today by three fabulous panellists who are going to talk to you about their careers in science, how they got into it, advice for you um, who are watching, and, uh, and kind of some next steps and uh, also an opportunity for you to ask some questions. So it's very informal. Uh, what I'm hoping is that most of you have had the opportunity already to look at the bios of our panellists and that you might already have some questions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about their careers in a minute, but you'll see that we have another panellist here who hasn't got their camera on. That's Katie, our head of engagement, and she is monitoring the chat. So if you have questions that you would like to put to our brilliant panellists, please put them in the chat and we will be coming to those questions later on in the session. So as we go, questions might occur to you but if you've got any already do start to send them through and Katie will keep an eye on those and we will uh, ask those towards the end. So before we start, um, well as we start what I'm going to do is just introduce myself a little bit more. So uh, I'm Jo Foster, I'm the director at IRIS as I said. Uh, my background is for 20 years I was a science teacher and a head of science and uh, vice principal in a big secondary school um, in Cornwall and uh, prior to that I've got a PhD uh, in ecology, so woodland ecology. So my background is in research. So that's one of the reasons why I really love research. And I'm really keen that all students get to do it too. Um, and although I am also a woman in science and I don't mind having questions, mostly this is about our other guests. So I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves, starting uh, with Ema and uh, just a, a little bit like their, their name and where they're currently working and what they're doing. And then in a moment when they've all introduced themselves, they're gonna tell us a bit about their typical day. So Ema, if we can start with you, please. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emer. Um, I'm originally from Ireland, but now I work as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford. Um, what that means is that I'm kind of at an in-between stage between being a PhD student and kind of a fully fledged academic, but uh, basically my job is full-time research. Um, and what I research is um, particle physics. So it's the science of the smallest building blocks of the universe and how they interact with each other. And I do that um, at the Large Hadron Collider machine at CERN, the CERN lab in Geneva. Which is very exciting. <laughs> Thank you, Ema. And those of you who have been involved in our Atlas uh, project might recognise Ema. She's in our videos and she's been at our masterclass and she's all around a bit of a celebrity. Uh, so, yeah, if, you want, if you've always wanted to ask Ema a question, then now's your chance. Do put one in the chat box and send it to Katie. Thank you, Ema. OK, next up is Soraya, also a, an Iris celebrity. So, Soraya, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, my name is Rhea. I'm a, currently a pharmacy student at Aston University and I'm also an Iris alumna. So I published a um, general article for astrophysics a year ago now. And I'm also currently working on some medical physics research in biophotonics, which should help fast track my PhD. Amazing. Thank you, Soraya. And also our researcher of the year for Iris in 2022. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well done. It's lovely to have you back, Sarah, and really always lovely to have someone who's gone through an Iris project and, you know, taken taken that further. Really exciting to hear what you're up to. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and Harsh Nera, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Harsh Nera, and um, I'm a protein biochemist by training. Um, but I currently work for a company called Google DeepMind, uh, which actually is um, a company that works in artificial intelligence research. And so I currently work in the biological side of that. So trying to use AI to solve problems in biology. Amazing. Thank you so much. And of course, AI is such an interesting area at the moment with lots of young people very interested in where that might go and where it might take them. So I'm sure we'll get some good questions about that, too. So what I've asked the panelists to do is to um, give us a little bit of a trot around their day, the sorts of things they might spend their day doing um, or, you know, the, the sort of best bits of their week, that sort of thing. Um, just so you can get a feel for what it really is like when you work in uh, a STEM career. So 
um, you'll be doing your um, exams at the moment. OK, there's a message there. Share any questions via this chat. So you can see that little box at the bottom. If you've got a question, just click on that and you'll be able to type your question in. Um, so, yes, our lessons at school, you know, you, you find out lots of information, you build your knowledge. And what I'm really keen for you guys to do is see where that might take you in the future. So that's what we're going to hear about now. So I'm going to. I'll stick with the same order. Um, so if you're happy to go first, uh, Ema, I'll let you go first. Yeah, sure thing. So I'll, yeah, I think I'll just walk through a typical day in the life. I'll take yesterday as an example. So I'll maybe, you know, I work in an office, so I'll start the day, I'll arrive in the office. Um, I'll start it off with a team meeting with my research group at CERN. One of the nice things about particle physics is that you get to work in research groups with, you know, some people might be in, in Switzerland, some people might be in Canada, you get to work with people all around the world. Um, then after that, before lunch, I might write a little bit of code. I do most of my research by analyzing data, which means practically most of the time, most of the time I'm working, I'm, I'm writing code to try and analyze the data that comes out of the experiment. Um, then I might have to run off to teach a class. That's one of the fun parts of being a researcher based at a university. You get to do your research, but also get involved with teaching as well. So I teach a group of, I teach quantum physics to a group of five really wonderful students um, here at Oxford. Then um, another fun thing, you know, come back. I really do, I really enjoy doing a lot of outreach work. So I might come back, work on, you know, preparing for something like this or putting together a poster or some resources for that. Um, and that would be sort of typically, it's, it's a really nice, I really like a job because it's a really nice mix. You know, most of the actual physics work I'll be doing, will be coding, um, but it's a lovely mix of face-to-face -face work with all sorts of different groups of people, which I really love about it. Brilliant, thank you. And lots of variety there. I was a bit surprised to hear no coffee involved in that day. I mean, my- Oh, the coffee is implicit. The, the coffee is okay, a given. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were gonna say, I go into the office and I get a yeah. coffee. Okay, yeah, great. And that variety, that sounds really, so I'm, I'm similar, I love a lot of variety in my role. And it does sound like, particularly with the outreach and the teaching, you've got lots of different things that you're juggling there. Yeah, and that's part of that's that's part of why I was drawn to this particular field of field of physics. I mean, I think there's a different there's a different setup to each kind of sphere of science. I think so. Whether you prefer, you know, to work away maybe in a lab just by yourself, like really really focused in, there's like plenty of field of fields of science where that that preference really works. Um, but then what I like about what I do is is the getting to work with sort of big teams of people around the world and do all sorts of different things. So regardless of how you prefer your day to look, you can kind of go into an area that works for you, I find. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Eva. That's really interesting and inspiring, especially, I mean, as well, you didn't even mention, you know, and occasionally I go off to the Hadron Collider and spend time <laughs> there. Like, that's pretty cool too. That's, that's, that. less of a, that's less of a typical day, but <laughs> it's not it's not infrequent. Another nice thing about being a, a, a researcher is, you know, you spend all of this time, like, generating this research, like, finding out these results. But that's not really doing much unless you communicate them to people. So another big aspect of the job is sort of traveling around to different conferences to like meet up with um, kind of other you know colleagues in the field to be able to present um, your findings to them. So that could involve like getting up on a stage and giving a talk about what you've done and what you found out. Or there's like a lower key you could present it like on a big like a a one a zero poster. And, you know, people will walk around and being able to ask you questions in a bit more kind of low key way. So that's yeah. less typical, but it's still definitely like a very important part of the job. Great. And lots of the students watching will either have had the opportunity to do that or will have the opportunity to do that at one of the RS conferences coming up this summer. Um, Soraya, I'm not sure if you were able to present your poster at the conference, but um, I know that Harshanira, you've been to some of our conferences and seen some of the research that's been presented. And Ema, I'm pretty sure you also have. Um, so, yes, those sorts of opportunities, you can try them. You can try it out now um, through Iris. Go and present some work to your peers. It's very exciting. Very like it really energizes you sharing what you're doing and chatting to other people who are also interested. Um, OK, so Soraya, you're next up. Could you tell us uh, what your kind of. I know it might be a bit difficult because I know your timetable will vary, but what sorts of things do you get up to on a typical day? So on a typical day or even a typical week, I think 
my timing is 23 main things. So one is to do with my pharmacy course. So that can be anything from lectures to clinical workshops to wet labs where we're developing drugs. And that's all sorts of different formulations, which is really cool. And something that surprised me is um, there's a lot of engineering actually involved in developing such a small drug, like the amount of physics and chemistry that actually goes into it. Um, another thing I do is I'm a Women in STEM scholarship ambassador. So I'm on a scholarship currently, and I get to meet a lot of cool scientists and CEOs of big scientific companies who fund my scholarship. And I get to tell them about my work and what I want to do in the future. And it's really nice to be able to share the experience with others. And they're millionaires, so they're really quite cool people. And we actually have a little hotel built into our university's business school, which is where we host all those dinners, which is really cool. And then the last part also, the last third of my week would be split up into doing my biophotonics uh, work, which I've currently started this year. So biophotonics is um, the study of light and anything to do with applications of light-based technology. So this includes things like lasers, anything of high energy radiations and the light spectrum. And then my particular application would be in neuro-oncology. So that's cancers in the brain. So I'm currently trying to do some summer interns for that to fast track my PhD, which should basically bring my passion for physics and then my medical background, which I'm developing now together. Wow. And Soraya, I hope you don't mind me doing this. I recognize some people are a little bit sensitive about it, but would you mind sharing how old you are, what year of your degree you're in? Yeah, I'm uh, 21 at the moment and I'm in my second year of university. So this is actually something that people don't realize is an opportunity that you can do. So if you can intern or do any research, not just you know at university, even whilst at sixth form, because the reason I this opportunity opened up to me was because one the actually the deputy dean of my uh, university's engineering school saw my iris paper, and she actually um, invited me to a lunch and said, you know what, I think you're a really bright young lady. And I think this opportunity could be available to you because I was so passionate about talking about how much I loved physics, even though I'm studying pharmacy, like at every scholarship lunch, at every sort of, every moment, literally, even with my friends, I'm just always sharing my knowledge. And that's what, one piece of advice, I know I'm skipping ahead here, but one piece of advice I would say is, if you are passionate about something, just tell everyone. Like, and if they don't want to hear you, they're losing out, honestly. But, you know, the most you can do is carry on talking about what you're passionate about. Because I think I've had a lot of people say this to me and other people would have heard similar things about, you know, physics isn't always a place that is welcoming for girls. But that's completely untrue. You know, if you are passionate about something, I would say go for it. Fantastic. So we're going to come back to some of that advice in a bit, Soraya, but you're such a brilliant example of someone who's like taken something, taken it a really long way. I mean, got your paper published, which is fantastic. We're really excited about that. But also, you know, applied some of what you use in your paper around the kind of high energy, it was high energy cosmic rays, wasn't it, into your degree already and already in your second year talking about your PhD, you know, not not for you doing things in series. You're going to do them together. Brilliant. <laughs> Really exciting. Um, and we'll catch up a little bit later on some advice to your younger self, which I think will be really interesting. Thank you. And um, Hashnira, please. Sure. Um, so I currently work in in this um, in the tech world, which is a little bit a uh, place that I never thought I would end up in. Um, I started out in a much more similar role to Ema. Um, and so actually a lot of Ema, the things that Ema said would have been my typical day as well, except that of I didn't code like you, but I would be in the lab doing experiments instead. So my day would also be similarly like having lab meetings with my team and then going off to do lab experiments, which is where I spent most of my time. Um, and then as you very importantly mentioned, communicating that to the rest of the world through conferences. Um, so some of them, some of that hasn't changed. I actually gave my first poster at this company yesterday, an internal conference that we have. So sometimes even if you work for a company, you have the opportunity to do academic things. 
Um, and despite working for a company, I also still do research. And I actually, I now manage an entire lab. So I have a team of scientists who I work with. And um, I do a little bit less science, but I basically guide the direction of the science that everybody else does. Um, and so my day is actually still somewhat similar. I spend a lot of time in the lab with my team discussing what everyone's going to do next. Um, sometimes I help them as well. Uh, sometimes they throw me out of the lab and, and they want to get on with it without me. Um, we have a lot of meetings uh, because uh, being in this really unique industry um, where the majority of people around us are actually machine learning scientists, we spend a lot of time trying to communicate our biology knowledge to them and vice versa. So um, this is actually been um, very interesting for me to learn the communication barriers that you can have between different types of scientists. Um, and it's been a real um, lovely challenge to try to solve problems which one party wouldn't have been able to solve without the other. So now that we have biologists and machine learning scientists working on the same problems, um, we're hoping to be able to solve problems across things like cancer and some of the things we've talked about already. Um, so yes, so my day is a lot of meetings, um, a little bit of experiments in the lab, um, and then yes, occasionally going to conferences and also doing events like this, which I try to do every few months. Um, apart from that, what do I do? I do drink some coffee. Uh, and um, as um, part of my role of managing a lab, you also get to do a lot more varied work apart from just science. So I now also work with um, teams like legal and finance and compliance and um, biosecurity and things you didn't even, well, I didn't know existed. So um, maybe others don't know they exist um, in trying to make sure that when we have our sciences ready to share with the world, we can do that in a responsible way. Great, thank you. And actually coming through, I think, from all of you is this idea of the broad, the breadth of the work that you're involved in. Um, and also the way that in order to make good progress, we need to work across fields. So I think that's one of the things which um, in school science sometimes, well, for all sorts of very good reasons, you know, subjects are split, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, you know, design technology, um, computer science, they're split. But in my everyday life, they segue one into another and so for example your email with your coding and your particle physics and uh, Soraya with your high energy radiation and your you know your uh, treatments for illnesses and your pharmacology like developing drugs and then seeing how they might be applied in different ways it it's true that when you're working in stem you really do get to use stuff from all sorts of places and it feels to me as though there are opportunities for all sorts of people because what we really need is a diversity of thought and experience and different sorts of people with different ideas working together that's how we're going to make good progress so that's really exciting now next question and I've got 13 minutes left on my trusty timer which I've got in front of me um this is the question about advice to your younger self so um I think if I was to give advice to my younger self, a lot of it would be around following my passion, which I was fortunate enough to do in the end. And I'm very fortunate to be doing now. But I think also having a bit more confidence in myself and, you know, believing in that kind of fire, the things I got really excited about. So for me, I think I'd kind of be like, worry less what other people think focus more on what you feel. Um, but that's not entirely practical, I suppose. So I'm sure you guys have got some really practical advice, whether it is, you know, how to choose your subjects, the attitude to take in. Um, Soraya, I think your, um, your point about, you know, sometimes people say that girls don't go to physics because, you know, it's not very welcome or whatever, and that's not at all what you found. Like, that is a really fantastic message, I think, to, to take forward. Um, so again, I hope you're okay with us going in the same order, Ema. Hopefully you've had longest to think about it because <laughs> you had the last answer. So what advice would you give to your younger self and to the, um, the people watching? Um, so one thing I really wish I'd been told earlier than I was um, was a phrase that I've taken with me ever since, which is uh, don't ask, don't get. <laughs> so I think back when I was a lot younger, like, you know, end of school, even throughout most of my time in university, I think I was always really afraid of asking for things because I always had this like almost ick about like, oh, no, what if they say no? And what if I'm like being a bit pushy, which is you know, maybe there's some sort of stereotypes about girls that might be the source of that. Um, but it wasn't until I sort of befriended, but, you know, went on a, an internship over to America, where I think in general, they're a lot more chill with being upfront about asking for stuff that I sort of saw it all around me. I was like, wait a minute, like this is this is how you get stuff done. The worst that someone can say is no. And in fact, it's quite possible that someone could say yes. 
So until I went on that internship, I always thought particle physics was the coolest thing ever. But I'd never had a chance, you know, I'm, I'm from Ireland where there isn't really the same infrastructure to do particle physics research. Um, so I was always afraid of putting myself out there. I was like, it doesn't seem any way, I don't see any way to do this. But it wasn't until I sort of got over that, like hesitation to actually go and ask for things. I was like, no, I really, I'm really passionate about particle physics. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put myself out there. I'm gonna like make applications to universities in other countries. Um, I've never done this before, but I, you know, I, I feel confident in my own physics abilities. Um, I think I can write a really good proposal. If I don't, if if I don't ask, I won't get a place. And the worst that they can say is no, none for you. And that's no different than not asking at all. Absolutely, I think that's awesome. I think that's brilliant advice, Ema. That if you don't ask, you don't get. You know, put yourself out there. The other thing to ask yourself is, if not me, then who? Like, I love this thing. Yeah. I think I'm really interested in it. I'm good at it. If not me, then who? Um, I think that's such good advice. Yes, um, ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. Or I think you put it slightly more eloqu eloquently. What did you say, Ima? I think I probably said the same, but... <laughs> okay, right, yeah. So ask. Put yourself out there. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, Soraya, please, what would your advice be to your younger self? I think my advice would be that if you don't see someone who is like what you want to be that doesn't mean you can't be that person um and I've literally you know I've done that and I want to be that example for a lot of young girls I've even gone back to my school to show them um what you can do and what you're capable of so an example of this was I come from a low-income background and I was applying for scholarships for university and I went back to school and one of the things I was really keen on was telling the girls look you know, you're all pretty much from the same area where, you know, I was raised. Why don't you apply for scholarships? Because chances are, you know, you'll get one. But it's the networking opportunities around it. And, you know, as I said, me going to lunches, talking to people, it's less about the money and more about, you know, the people you can meet for me in that sense. And one of the girls said to me, what's the point? What's the point of applying to the scholarship? I might not even get it anyways or oh, I don't really need it. And I was just taken aback. And then I had to step back and think, okay, I need to break this wall down with her because she's put her, she's put it in her mind that she doesn't need this. But for me, I'd say if you need support, literally whether it be, you know, you have to talk to someone, you need financial support, you need help in any other way, please do reach out to these people, these organizations, charities like Iris, they, your teachers can even help you. And, you know, the worst as, um, Ema said the worst that people can say is no, but at least you tried to do that thing. And the second thing I would say is don't stop being passionate about whatever you're passionate about. And life will throw, you know, curveballs at you. Um, one of the curveballs that I've always had is with my house, which is why I wasn't able to come to do the presentation at the IRIS conference. But it doesn't mean that it has the IRIS whole project as a whole it hasn't opened up doors to me it definitely has done so you know if there is something that has happened that doesn't look entirely great you know the whole picture isn't ruined um I would definitely say that to my younger self because I think I was a bit of a diva <laughs> when I was younger so if one thing went wrong I just panic or sort of just moan and whinge but you know if you're not gonna pick yourself up and get yourself out there and do the things you love then as you know, Joel said, who is going to do that? Brilliant. Thank you, Soraya. And although you weren't able to come to the awards event, you did write the most incredible speech, which made me cry. And not only me, but also some of the trustees. So don't do yourself down there. Even though you weren't there, you really were in spirit. OK, fantastic. Thank you, Soraya. Um, and Hashlira, please. Thanks. I really resonate with lots of the things you've already said about grabbing opportunities and doing what you love and being passionate about the things you're passionate about. So maybe to give some slightly different advice then um, is to um, learn from your mistakes. That's one thing which I've learned that not a lot of people are very good at critiquing themselves. Um, and you should take risks all, all the time because um, how else will you learn? Which does mean that you're going to make mistakes and the most valuable way for you to learn and become better is to, to really learn from your mistakes. Um, and I think this you know, feeds into grabbing opportunities um, like Ema and Soraya have already said, where, you know, where they come about, but also creating them for yourself if you can and not being afraid to put yourself out there, but 
then being making sure to you know that that might not always go well but that's okay um, and you should just learn from from everything you learn through that process brilliant i i i'd i'd agree i think i know a lot of people who maybe would have a slight tendency me me especially to want a slight perfectionistic tendency tendency and be really afraid to do anything in case i got it a little bit wrong and learning that getting it a bit wrong isn't a bad thing in fact it's a really good thing because that's how you get better was a massive like a massive thing to overcome in my head Something which has really surprised me, which I'll share as well, is that even people, like really important people who look like they've totally got it all together, are still terrified quite a lot of the time that they're going to get something wrong or that they're not good enough. Like that is totally normal. And I'm always saying to people, like, if you're scared, just do it scared, um, because there's only one way to do it. And that's kind of if you're scared, then you still got to do it. So just do it scared and you'll be through it. Um, that is that feeling of like not good enough or worried about things that is a totally normal feeling it's just your your mind trying to protect yourself and if you feel like that lots of other people feel like that including really important people and it's totally normal and it's just you know you just have to kind of do it to get through it um so i haven't got any questions from the people watching but i have got another question which um which is one that is just kind of a personal interest of mine and I think will resonate with the people watching. If um, if those of you watching do have a question that you think of towards the end, then just send it through and we will try to get a response via email from the panelists. So this is my question for you. All of you are in really interesting fields with really interesting futures. What do you think the most exciting development over the next 10 years will be in your field? Because that's where the people watching will be headed. So what do you think the most exciting development over the next 10 years will be? And this is a complete spring on the panelists, this question. So I didn't tell them in advance that I was going to ask this. So we're getting a real gut reaction here from the panelists. Does anyone want to volunteer to go first? Anyone ready with an answer? Nobody. OK, well, <laughs> I'll, 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 let's I'll go volunteer. <laughs> what exciting developments do you think there might be? So over the next over over the next ten years, um, our our experiment, the the Large Hadron Collider, is going to get some major upgrades. That means we're going to have like ten times as much data to analyze as we do at the minute, um, which is really important for things like looking for new particles because the you know the particles we haven't found yet, kind of by definition, are probably going to be very rare and we'll need a lot of data to be able to see them. But to be able to analyze that, I think that goes hand in hand with the other really exciting development, which sort of ties into what Hashinira does, which is um, the how like machine learning and artificial intelligence are developing like all the time and at such a big pace. Like when I started, they're really like that we had a couple of like machine learning based tools, but like nowadays nearly everyone is doing some sort of machine learning in their data analysis as part of our as part of our research. And we're not even at, at as much of a cutting edge as uh, folks over in Google are. So I think how the like much, much bigger data set will go hand in hand with how much better machine learning is getting will make the field really interesting. And loads um, more jobs maybe in that area. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Soraya, I haven't mentioned this, I don't think yet, but you have got another workshop to go to in two minutes. So I'm going to let you answer your question fairly briefly. And then if you need to dip out to go to your other um, event, then obviously do. What do you, what's the most exciting development do you think coming up in your field? So I think at the moment for my um, perspective as a pharmacy course, it would be computational chemistry and the power of AI because we have to screen a lot of um, drugs and drug leads and it's absolutely horrendous work in terms of the actual computational modeling and being able to, the amount of assumptions that's sort of going to it. But AI has this whole new possibility in sort of trying to get those assumptions a lot more accurate and having a whole new plethora of drugs and drug leads being scanned and just the amount of drugs that can be scanned. Fantastic, thank you. There's a real theme emerging here um, and I would encourage any um, young women watching that computer science might be a really powerful area to explore um, if you want to be well prepared for your future. Um, Soraya, I know you have to go, so thank you so much for joining. And um, Harshnira, if you want to answer that final question, to the extent you're able, I know that some of your, some of your, um, what you do is commercially sensitive, but what do you think the most exciting areas for development are? Yeah, I think um, Ema and Soraya kind of got there before me. So, <laughs> of course, I'm here for a reason. I also think that AI will be the biggest um, 
you know, new um amazing thing that changes our lives for for the better hopefully in this century and not not in this century in the next decade um i think we're already seeing some early um signs of that in our everyday lives i'm sure lots of you here have heard of things like chat gpt and you maybe some of you have also used it uh, i must admit that i don't use it quite as much as i should have um and i think um you know, we're continuing to build on things like this. And I'm sure that in the next few years, we will see advances in AI technologies for all sorts of fields from, you know, from science fields, which is like what I work on, but also to more um, maybe AI across your daily lives. Um, and so, yes, I, I hope it's something that we also, you know, prepare our our next generations for as well so I hope you learn about AI at school I definitely didn't so um, <laughs> but if not then play with GPT uh, chat GPT for yourselves anyway to get used to what this new world might look like um, but yes as Ima and Soraya both said I think the possibilities of what we can do um, with being able to use smarter technologies to help us analyze much bigger data sets at a much faster speed should help us um, have impact across fields from research to drug discovery to, um, I don't know, climate change. You, who knows what's coming next? Um, so I hope that, yeah, this is a really powerful technology and we use it wisely. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, OK, so some really clear messages, I think. Um, I don't think we've had any additional questions from those of you watching. But as I said, you can email through questions and we will try to get the panel to answer them. I really hope you've got a bit of a flavour of some of the fantastic opportunities that are out there for you. Um, do have a look at some of the, uh, if you're not already involved in uh, in our project, you know, maybe in the next academic year, you might be interested in doing one. They, we have got a couple which are around data, um, a new one coming, which is very exciting to do with uh, data, GPS and tracking. And uh, we've, of course, got our Atlas Big Data project, which uh, Ema helps us with, um, which, in fact, we had a group of students who won one of our awards last year who used AI to help to um, analyze and interpret the data. Um, they just came up with this method, which it turned out was one that's already being used, but we hadn't told the students <laughs> that, so they worked it out for themselves. Um, but yeah, some really exciting uh, things we've heard today, and I'm really grateful for your time, uh, Ema and Harshnira, and also also Soraya, who's headed off. I'm going to call it a day now because it's uh, 4.01, but we're really grateful. Um, thank you very much for coming, and thank you to those of you watching as well, um, and see you again soon. Goodbye.